You're listening to the Finding Career Zen podcast. I'm your host, Pete Newsom, and my guest today is Steve Glomsky, who is CEO and founder of Shift6 and Abra. Steve, welcome. How are you today? I'm awesome. Thanks for having me today, Pete. Man, thank you for joining. I've been trying to get you on for, for quite a while now. You're a busy guy. Uh, there's lots to do. Well, let, let's talk about that. Would you mind, Steve, if we started in introducing both um, Shift 6 and Abra so we can use that as a basis for conversation? You'll do a much better job describing you know, who you are and uh, and what your businesses are about than I can. Uh, sure. Yeah, I appreciate it. So um, I've been in the staffing industry for you know, a better part of the last 15 years or so in a very niche market uh, focused in the hospital marketplace supporting organizations, building IT teams to support major initiatives like electronic health record implementations, other enterprise systems like ERP systems and so on and so forth. And uh, Shift6 is a service firm supporting building teams just like that. Um, Abra is a technology platform that is basically like an Airbnb, if you will, for healthcare IT talent. And instead of them listing their properties and availability, uh, when it can be rented, they are listing their capacity and availability to provide work and services to organizations. Um, so that in a nutshell is Abra and Shift6. So Abra is is new. How, how long uh, has Abra been out? How long ago did you launch it? We launched the platform uh, just over three weeks ago. So Brand very, new. Very new to the community. Uh, we founded the organization earlier this year and have had a development team building out the system. And we're excited to be, ha have launched and be able to be downloaded. And the growth has been incredible in the first three weeks already. That's awesome. I, I, the site is, looks great. I, I've been through it. I mean, you know, kudos to you for for you know, putting out um, something that just looks like it's 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 just ready to go and um, as nice as anything I've seen. What what was your what was a catalyst for doing this? I mean, it comes with with no small effort. I I know that. Um, what what where did where did this idea come from initially? Well, it's fifteen years of uh, being frustrated with manual processes to make stuff happen. Um, so so when you're building teams, uh, flexible temporary teams specifically to support big initiatives like implementing a massive electronic health record in a hospital. There's so much work that goes into aligning talent in the marketplace with those needs on a contract basis. And unfortunately, the tools and uh, databases that are out there online today just don't have the information that you need to make the decisions of who you should be talking to and when to align uh, talent with projects. So you look at the tools like Career Builder, Monster, Indeed, LinkedIn, for that matter, and they've got some valuable information about skills, uh, you know, that's all in a keyword based format. So you have to be really good at form formulating like complex Boolean queries as a recruiter to cast your right net and talk to the right audience. You can post jobs and wait till people respond. But, you know, you have to actually go out and hunt and find those people. And the process of getting those people on the phones and trying to verify, are they available? Are they interested? Are they willing to travel to a certain part of the country for a certain amount of time? And all those other data points are completely missing out there. And so that's what Abra aims to solve for is to collect all the right information about that community uh, to make sure recruiters are able to focus in on exactly who they need to be building a relationship with and when. So drive some major efficiency in that process which will then pass on value to the talent pool because the extra cost that went into trying to find them is being charged to the end organization who's purchasing their services, which is an opportunity cost for their wages, if you think about that. And then the firms that are doing all that work and heavy, you know, manual outreach and, uh, you know, to me, wasted efforts in, in my mind, um, all that is translated to more operating costs and gets passed on to the organization purchasing the services. So Abra is aiming to drive more efficient communication between talent, break down those barriers, create some transparency in the marketplace, and ultimately allow organizations to have a more flexible workforce, uh, engage talent when they need them. Are you suggesting that our system is antiquated? Is that what you're saying here? It has been for some time. And you've seen some progress with some other you know, gig economy type uh, platforms out there, uh, Upwork. As a matter of fact, I, I built some tools uh, over a decade ago, uh, hiring developers in Pakistan. And I had an executive assistant in the Philippines and using labor arbitrage, you could get some really cost-effective support 
for different initiatives. But the challenge with some of those platforms are too generic, too broad. They're entirely focused on only remote work. They're missing a lot of the information necessary. And so as we progress into these new, more niche talent communities, there's more information that's necessary and we're bridging that gap. Well, I, I said that somewhat tongue in cheek because of course it is antiquated and resumes and job descriptions really haven't evolved much in 50 plus years. It, it sort of it follows the same format. So they may be emailed or uploaded today versus delivered by hand or by mail, but they look the same. And you have to almost be willing uh, to play in that, you know, play by those rules today. If you want to upload a resume on the site you mentioned, career builder, whoever it is, you have to fill in the, the blanks as they uh, prescribe them. And I can say definitively, I've had this uh, this thought for, for many, many years now as a, as a recruiter, I don't recruit that way. I, I don't I don't fill jobs that way. Um, when I take, I'll just start with a job description itself and I'll let you weigh in on this. The first thing I did, I sold staffing services for years. I don't get to do that anymore, but I'm stuck behind a desk like I am now. But when I did, the first thing I would do with the job description is put it aside and say, you know, say to the manager I was working with or the HR person, if, if that's who it was, all right, now tell me who you need describe who you need. And rarely, if ever, would it resemble what was on an HR approved job description that followed a, a certain formula. So so talk about that for a minute. I mean, when it comes to hiring, uh, what 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 would you, you know, what are you doing differently to, to set the stage for, uh, you know, uh, for the need to more closely resemble, you know, what's what reality is? I think you make a great point, Pete. Uh, the job descriptions themselves are antiquated. Um, you know, job description to me is it's really a, a marketing tool to attract talent, uh, the right talent to your organization. And you almost need to tell a story about why they want to come work in that environment, on that team, for that organization, for the mission that it's about. Um, and job description often lack that type of information. But you know, Abra doesn't solve for that. Um, that that's more on um, you know the interview process, and uh, you know once they've identified and aligned a person's skills, interests, and availability with the opportunity, that the more soft skill story and selling of actually closing a deal happens on the back end. Abra doesn't close the deal. Abra just brings the right talent with the opportunities together. But I do think that you know one of the things that we're doing that's a lot more progressive in terms of job descriptions and aligning and matching talent with opportunities is around a very structured skill taxonomy. I mentioned earlier the use of Boolean, uh, complex Boolean searches and keyword-based uh, engines for finding folks. When, when you publish a resume online, you know, the, the tool that you publish that in tries to index all the keywords and then the way people find you is by typing in keywords. And unfortunately, there's like sometimes there's 50 different ways to say the same thing. And if you didn't type your keyword the same way that the person who's trying to find you is thinking about that same idea, it's sometimes going to be a scenario where they miss you and you don't show up in their search result and they don't reach out to you about a relevant opportunity when you're perfectly aligned for it. And so one of the things that Abra is doing in a very sophisticated way is building out and managing and maintaining a very complex structured skill taxonomy, like your old school biology, kingdom, phylum, class, order, genus, species, if you recall. I don't and, recall, but you you clearly do. You were a, a bio major, <laughs> so, you know, um, it, it's me. A classification of the plant and animal kingdom, right? So right. everything falls into a certain hierarchical structure. And the same thing goes for skills. If you think about skills in a hospital IT environment, you've got a role that you play. Are you an advisor? Are you an application analyst? Are you support? you know, then what products do you have experience with? Within those products, which modules and functional areas do you support and so on and so forth. And that taxonomy can be infinitely complex. And so we started the ABRA with a base taxonomy, but then we're crowdsourcing additional inputs and entries into that taxonomy and have an administrative approval management system on the back end that we're constantly growing that skill uh, architecture. And so by doing so, we're, in, we're basically removing the complexities of keyword searching and Boolean searching, making it really easy for managers even, not necessarily just recruiters, to go in and find exactly what they're looking for without missing 
the talent pool that they're looking to talk to. So it's a much more efficient, structured way to align talent with opportunities in market. You mentioned that that it's growing. It sounds like it's from your user base who gets to contribute. How, how does that work exactly? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that is that's unique. I mean, that is no one's doing anything like that, as far as I know. Yeah, the market we're uh, we're spending our time in right now is is a pretty contained market, uh, but it's growing. Um, <clears throat> it's a small world. Everybody knows everybody for the most part, um, or is at least two degrees away from everyone else. Uh, we have an aggressive you know, outreach campaign through emails and text messages and posting on the online channels that are very relevant to our community to get our initial user base growth happening. But then within the application, we have social features and connections and reasons to collaborate within the application, invite others to join, provide feedback, so on and so forth. So it's getting to be kind of the point where it's growing on its own just from the engagement and you know, opportunity to leverage the, the value of being connected within the application to grow it. Very nice. Um, you mentioned staffing companies. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. You, you, you own a staffing company. I own a staffing company, but you're creating a scenario where in many, in, in, in some cases, that may not be necessary. So um, just talk about that uh, just, just for a minute on, on you know, who, how can you, you're, you're creating efficiencies, right? I want to make sure I understand this um, it, by just connecting the, 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 the true need, right? That the, the, the client side has with the, the true capability of the individual. How do they ultimately find each other in, on, on Abra? How does, you know, do, does, does, one side per, um, indicate that they're looking, the other side indicate that they're available. What? How, how does that work exactly? Yeah, this is, I think, one one other thing that we're doing that's really unique as well uh, within the Abra platform is it's not shoppable. And what I mean by that, on both sides, as an employer, you can't just go in and then like use customized filters to find how many people have that, you know, matching what you're looking for with, you know, let's say one or two filters. And on the talent side, you can't go in there and just browse a list of jobs. The way Abra works is it's sophisticated in that you list out exactly what you have to offer the market and what your preferences and availability are as a talent provider. And on the employer side, I have to list out all the, the criteria around my engagement of what I need and when I need it and how I need it. And the system only exposes talent with opportunities that's relevant. And that's actually a common complaint we hear from talent providers in the market is that they're getting bombarded by talent acquisition team members, managers, about opportunities that are not relevant to them. And that's a lot of a lot of time and energy that goes into that to say, I went down this whole process. I went through three interviews to find out at the very end that uh, my compensation expectation was too high or that they needed me to be on site in Washington. And I live in Florida and I'm not interested in traveling there every other week. So, you know, we get, all, get rid of all that mess and wasted time and energy through only aligning talent and opportunities that are relevant to each other. That's one thing that's really unique uh, um, about what we're doing um, in the Abra platform. How many how many points of uh, criteria are applied, you know, on uh, to to make that match? My goodness, um, it's at least twenty, and yeah. it can actually be much more sophisticated than that, based on how complex the skill taxonomy is defined in the need and in the talent profile. Okay, it could be it can get much larger than that too. They can. Okay. And so there are scenarios where there's just not a match. And, you know, that's a real scenario in the world today where there's just not a match. And, uh, you know, how, how do we address that in the marketplace? Uh, we are tickling talent providers and employers with very close matches as well on the side to say, hey, what you're looking for is not something that's available in the market today. However, if you bend and have some flexibility on these criteria, you might be able to get something done where you can still get value out of the market circumstances today. So that's one thing that's really interesting. Now, come back to your question around, you know, recruiting teams and, you know, is is it making it not necessary anymore? Not at all. I mean, uh, recruiters are always going to be necessary and relevant for a lot of reasons. Number one, technology can't replace relationship or trust ever. I, I, I know that for a fact. Uh, it's an efficiency tool to allow recruiters to build relationships with the talent that they should be spending their time building a relationship with. As sure. opposed to you, you hear people online uh, complaining about being ghosted by recruiters or you know not, not hearing follow-up about their application. 
it's because of this antiquated system that we're in that requires recruiters just to do this massive spread attack and then they just, they can't stay, it's very difficult to stay organized as a recruiter today because you're gauged on how many placements you make. And if, if I spend time circling back with everyone, I'm losing the traction that I have to go and produce more as a, as a recruiter in the marketplace. So the other, the other one other comment that I'd like to, to comment around in uh, re recruiters specifically and how ABRA doesn't solve for it is, Abra is a marketplace that aligns people that have set their specific preferences and needs and availability and capacity to take work. Recruiters are necessary to go out and do the true plucking, headhunting, and pulling people out of an opportunity that are passive job seekers. Abra doesn't do that. That is not what Abra does. And you've sold staffing services uh, with, with your business, Pete. You know that full well that there's a sales uh, component to recruiting and going out and finding someone and convincing them to, you know, make get make a big difference in their life change their careers that's a big decision to make uh, that takes effort and human human interaction no matter what i i love what you're describing in terms of um letting uh in, in a, if i'm looking at this incorrectly tell me but almost letting the data speak for itself so when we get calls from uh companies who need to hire usually it's a problem i can't solve Right, it's like, hey, we you know, we can't find anyone. Um, and and you know, here's a position, here's here's a salary, here's what it's paying, and we spend you know, it's a little bit of time on it and quickly conclude, well, you're you're paying forty percent under the market value. We're not magicians. That's a problem we can't solve. But it would be nice to have a system, and I think this is in large part what you're describing, where the data speaks for itself to some degree, where yep. you put in, you know, you can write whatever you want in terms of requirements, you can make it as narrow as you possibly want. And if you need a hundred things, you can make all a hundred things critical, but there's no one who can do the job to meet match that criteria at the rate you're paying. So yeah. I, I think it's, it's brilliant to let that speak for itself, right? Like let's cut any emotion, you know, verbal interaction out of that equation. And let's, because I, I look, there's always going to be a huge need for recruiters for the reasons you said, but we waste a lot of time on the back and forth. And so we end up disqualifying most of the, the calls that come our way, because like I said, we're just, it's a, it's a problem we can't solve. You, you know, lower your requirements, be more flexible on the, on the criteria or raise your comp. I mean, those are generally the things that, that, that you know, could solve most hiring problems. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's staffing firms, they're brokers and they have to get, both sides of that equation to come closer together to, to make a deal work. And let's just create some transparency around the data. You know, the problem is that data isn't published anywhere. It's not accessible anywhere today. And I'm exposing that in a niche market and then we're expanding horizontally to other skill domains and markets. That's, that's, that's great. Um, you mentioned the, the freelance economy. So talk about that a little bit on how you see that coming into play um, with Abra and what you're doing versus the traditional employee employer relationship. I, I'll weigh in on that if you you know along the way too, because I think um that's something that also needs significant improvement and the freelance economy in many respects solves that. So how does Abra address that particular issue? Well, fortunately for uh the market that I spend most of my time in, provider technology, uh that freelance uh, marketplace has already been um very progressive. Uh, you know, folks that understand the skills and, and expertise they bring to the market is highly coveted and, and needed, and they're very good at what they do. They've empowered themselves very quickly and early on, as early as 15 years ago, to start working as independents. Um, and, and they're leveraging the consulting staffing firm organizations to get exposure to the opportunities. That's the way that they find and engage in, in work opportunities for them. So there hasn't been a platform uh, to this point yet that enabled that in an efficient way until Abra, uh, but it's already happening. And I, you know, I've talked to some employers, some hospital executives that you know have asked, "Well, is this going to um, make more of the workforce leave uh, job security and become a, a gig worker and, and all that?" The answer is probably a small percentage of them, but certainly not the whole uh, uh, group of them. And th there's a number of reasons why I suspect that. People are comfortable in, in sustainability and, and comfort of 
the cultures of their teams and the family work environment that they have, the full-time employment benefits. Hospitals have you know, some of the best benefits that any employee can ever get. So some people are just really comfortable with consistency. And but what's really exciting about what ABRA is doing is it's allowing employees of organizations like that to still get access to some fractional work opportunities, some moonlighting opportunities, as long as their employer is willing uh, to allow that to happen through the ABRA platform. They want to make some extra money for the holidays. They can sign up, fill out capacity on nights and weekends to take on a very specialized project that there's very few people in this community that can do, but they're willing to put in an extra 20 hours a week for the next six months. Why not empower that talent provider to do that? So that's something that doesn't get brokered at all today. Um, that that night moonlight uh, weekend hours. There is some of it happening, but it's under the table and it's frowned upon. But if we create an environment that allows transparency and the employer knows it and can manage to it, we, we're anticipating we're going to see a lot more of that happening. Uh, well, where you, you just said, there. and what you just said at the end is is key to that working effectively um, and and working well, which is be open. Don't 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 sneak around if you're going to do that. Um, you don't want to be caught with your hand in the cookie jar um, in that scenario. And it is a small world as we know, and those things do yeah. tend to to you know come to the surface eventually. Um, but I, I I'm really glad you made the point about about moonlighting. I just wrote an article uh, two weeks ago on passive job seeking, and you know, as recruiters, you, you know as well as I do, we call people and they say, "Hey, I'm good. I'm not interested in another opportunity." And and you would probably say what I say over the years, which is you should always be on the market, right? I mean, if if, if I get a call. Right now, to to go, uh, you know, play quarterback for for the Bucks. If, if Tom Brady decides he wants to move on, I'm doing it. Right? Forget that I run two businesses and am otherwise satisfied. If I if I can go be an NFL quarterback, I'm there. So we all have a job that we would leave for. And when it comes to freelance, it seems intimidating and scary and uncertain. You know, you mentioned security and comfort. I mean, those are that's those are perceived things, right? Maybe not reality. But you don't know what you don't know. And so one of the things that I wrote in this article was to stick your, you know, dip your toe in the water, right? You don't have to go all in and go full-time freelance and, 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 and all the you know, perceived risk that comes with that. Figure out a way to take on a project, you know, get, get your, get your um, self out there. And I believe that most people will see that it is a great way to work. I mean, I am a huge proponent of it. I'm a big user of freelance talent, and um, I think it's I think it's healthy. I mean, that's the best word that I typically use when describing it. I think it, it's a very healthy relationship, or maybe even even more specifically, it removes the unhealthy parts of the employee employer relationship that um, you know at times plague us in the workspace. That's why HR departments are so big, right? It's yeah. not because things are going so well um, yeah. in those relationships. Freelance solves all of that. So do you, do you agree with or disagree with any of that? No, I mean, I, I agree. And even more so on developing new skills. If you're stagnant in the same environment uh, for 15 years, you're, you're going to be limited on the amount of exposure of processes and, uh, and tools and techniques and methodologies on how to get better at doing things. And, you know, that's why we're, we're encouraging folks to, you know, like you said, put your foot in the water, look at what else you can be doing. You could see uh, how other teams tackle the problem that your team has been doing something one way for, you know, as long as you can remember, and there's a way to do it in half the time. And you just didn't know about that just because you never got exposed to it. And so what we're trying to do is give people a pathway to develop and grow, bring solutions back into their own organizations that they're at, if they want to stay loyal, like, you don't have to dip, d dive in full speed head first right into being a freelancer exclusively. Abra as a platform allows you to take on freelance work while you're still a full-time employee, as long as your employer is allowing you to do so. And fortunately for us, we've talked to a lot of healthcare IT executives that are excited about that. They're progressive. They, they, they get it. They know that retention of their team members is, is really important. And when their team is, you know, half the time they're put, getting low value work put on their plate, but they're studied to be really high value employees, just because that's the nature of maintaining environment. 
Let's give them some more challenging work. I don't have it in my environment, but let me let you go do that for another organization and bring what you learn back here. Maybe we can improve our environment as well. So some really cool signs from the employer community that are buying into uh, enabling something like that with their employees. You know, it's interesting. I don't, I don't have nearly the exposure and experience you have with uh, healthcare IT, but I can think of a couple of instances where we've um, needed to find someone on behalf of our client uh, who, who's in, in a niche role, a rare skill set. And in healthcare IT specifically, at a high level, they've been much more accommodating to out of the ordinary scenarios, as you're describing, someone who can only work part time. Uh, that sort of thing. And um, you know, that's that's not the norm in, in our normal corporate you know, staffing relationships. Anything out of the box really isn't isn't um, embraced you know, very, very easily. Healthcare IT is seems to be different. At least that's my limited exposure. Do, is that is that prevalent across the, the entire space? And if so, why? I'd say it's prevalent around any really complex skill environment that take multiple different um, niche skills that have a long learning curve in order to make an environment operate. And enterprise apps is a is a perfect example of that. So any complex ERP system or supply chain system or human capital management system, there's multiple modules. They, you know, the, the, the technology team members need to be operationally knowledgeable. They need to understand workflows and you understand how to uh, what to expect the user to experience. And there's just a lot of complexities around that. And when you have such a complex skill environment, you also, uh, and then on top of that, you layer in like requirements for product specific certifications and things like that, that cost money and time. Uh, any environment like that is rich for the solution that we built into Abra. Um, I, I get it, like what you're talking about, it doesn't necessarily translate to all other corporate type skills and, and, and teams. Uh, where there's maybe a shorter learning curve or there's a much larger population of talent that can be pulled from. But then also you layer in the complexity of required to be on site to do some of this work. Um, you can't just do all this work remotely. You can't, some of it you can, some of it you can't. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, things and considerations around that. But I'd say enterprise apps is very uh, a very specific community. I think some of the new work around cloud services uh, that health systems are getting involved in doing, some of the complexities around infrastructure and information security, all that relevant, you know, very niche specific product experience, certifications, um, understanding workflow and data and, and those in uh, healthcare environments. There's, there's all sorts of complexities that are required considerations. So uh, I'm, I'm speaking right now to anyone listening who's, who's early in their career or, or still trying to figure out who, what, what it is they want to do. Um, you, like me, you, you have a big, uh, a big family, a lot of kids. And I tell mine, mine are older than yours, learn to code. Learn to code, learn to code, right? I mean, that that's, is, do you agree? I mean, there's just such a shortage of um, of employees in many respects, why we need better um, systems and, and ways of connecting talent with opportunity because there's there's a shortage of talent at, at a high level. Yeah, you know, learn, learn to code is good advice. Um, I would say that really becoming a student of the environment that you are passionate about uh, is really important. You know, you look at organizations that are trying to just hire people off the streets and then train them on the products to, to support those environments. It's a failed approach. Uh, what's more successful is hiring people that work in operations in those departments and then learn the technology after. So, yes, you need to fundamentally understand how um, systems work, how uh, how work, how to define workflow. So more of a like problem solving skills. Um, but knowing an, an environment really well, operational workflow. So let's say you're in HR and you've been an HR journalist for years and then your organization is going through, you know, implementing a brand new system. Who knows that environment better than you? Nobody. So right. you might be tapped as a subject matter expert to help the technical team go in and make those changes and implement the software. Or you can actually go in and become that technical person that brings all that valued operational understanding and expertise into that environment. Now you're worth a lot to the organization. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, specific knowledge, right? You, you can't replace that. Um, that has value always. Um, tell me uh, high level, and I know you've described it, but just to be, I wanna be really succinct and clear with this. 
on the both the client side or buyer side, if you will, and candidate side, who should check out Avra? I mean, just you know, who speak to speak to the audience and say this is this is really who your tar- target is right now. On the talent side, it's anyone that's supporting enterprise apps in the healthcare uh, uh, environment, and specifically provider organizations. So that's anyone that's supporting. EHR systems like Epic, Cerner, Allscripts, Meditech, NextGen, to name a few, uh, ERP systems, Oracle Cloud, Workday, PeopleSoft, Kronos, um, you got uh, human capital management systems, uh, some of those same names I just referenced, service management, so ServiceNow, Heat, BMC, Remedy, uh, you name it. On the employer side, it's any leader in a healthcare organization uh, that's focused on building IT teams and driving IT initiatives or it's any IT staffing and consulting firm that supports uh, the provider community. Great. And then if you're not a leader, but you see the value in, in what the platform could deliver, what's the pitch internally? I mean, is that, did, did they call you, know, if, it, it, where do they go to, 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 to run that up the ladder and to, to get the buy-in? I mean, how, how would you approach that if you were a manager level who didn't have the clout and authority to, to make the call, but see, see the value? Well, I think they're all feeling the pain, and so it's it's easy to surface a, a new solution um, that's addressing one of the largest pain points that every organization is facing today. I mean, there's certainly a talent squeeze in healthcare IT. Um, it's hey, here's a here's a platform that can enable us to, in a more affordable way, engage a flexible workforce that we know we depend on every day. And unfortunately, we've got this massive backlog of projects that is sitting on the side and our customers are upset with us because we're not addressing their projects because we're having to prioritize. We've got limited resources and limited budget. Well, if we can do X more with our budget, we can accelerate some of those projects. So even if you're not an IT in a healthcare organization, let's say you're an operational leader in an emergency department, and you know you hear about Abra and you've got a backlog of projects you've asked the IT team to work on, but they're not getting to it. You know, bring this to your IT executive and let them know, here's a pathway to free up some budget uh, for you to get access to the talent you need to help drive these projects forward. Perfect. All right. So, Steve, I'm not going to let you go quite yet. I, I want to spend just a couple of minutes on Steve Glomsky, the entrepreneur, who's now started two businesses. What is it that you think, I mean, you had this little introspection here, but what what is it that in your history, background, makeup that um, you think has allowed you to to be an entrepreneur? What does what does that take, if you will? Because look, a lot of people want to, not nearly as many people actually take the step. So that's admirable, and and it and it takes some confidence and um, and some risk. But um, why why you why why do you think? Well, you took some words out of my mouth that I was thinking about as you were. Sorry, I answered the, I, I just kept going. I should have just stopped. I mean, like, look, um, <clears throat> you've got to be okay uh, with the potential to fail. Like you just have to, you have to accept that, that there is a chance you're going to fail. I mean, what's the statistics out there? I think like 90% of entrepreneurs fail at least a few times before they have a success run. Um, so having the a tolerance for risk is really important. I think um, work ethic is in, in my mind, the, the biggest lever that you can pull to, to blue collar your way through all the trials, trials and tribulations that you're going to get. I think another thing that um, has been, uh, I guess, um, very important to, to my, my success and my, my pathway there has been just being in high integrity, like being honest with yourself, being honest with your customers, being honest with your employees. Uh, that goes a long way because we talked about it earlier, reputation matters. And, um, you know, if you, if you make, if you're, if you're not, if you don't have high integrity, I mean, you're, you're just going to build a poor reputation for yourself. Um, I think leadership is, is critical. Um, you know, leading from the trenches, not asking anyone to do anything that you're not willing to do yourself lead by example. Uh, I certainly, uh, do that on a daily basis in, in both of my businesses. Um, and I think that's a, a good foundation. Uh, it is. For, I, for no, some, I, I appreciate you answering that. I mean, t- talk to me about though, um, if you could go back and 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 do anything differently, uh, to, you know, between you know, from the time you started your career, maybe even in school, uh, to where you are now. What what would that be? That's a great question. I would say, um, while I loved my my education, I studied biology because I was fascinated with how 
That's how you remembered the the you know the yeah. hierarchy earlier. I, I was feeling pretty insecure after that, after you rattled that off. I think about it like life is a miracle, right? Like that's really fascinating how our, our, our bodies are like the perfect machine. So I studied that because I was fascinated by it, but um, I didn't realize that I would be so fascinated with business and economics and the ability to influence the world in a much larger scale through business. And uh, so I guess the, the one thing I would change, I would have studied some type of uh, business related degree just to, to give myself a, you know, a, a launching pad earlier, potentially. Um, I didn't know that that was a passion that I had until after I finished school and I took my first job as a recruiter at a healthcare uh, staffing agency back okay. in 2006. So, do, do you think that's been a disadvantage to you in, in the business world, not having having that degree? Um, <clears throat> or or maybe say, has I it been a, a hurdle hard. you to overcome, right? That, that you haven't, because I, 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 I've never thought that. I have a poli sci degree. I'm, I'm someone who often talks about, um, you know, uh, opportunities that I don't necessarily think college is a requirement. I'll just say that, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, but, but to the question, I mean, do, do you think it's impacted you in a negative way? I think there's been times where I could have been equipped with some some more knowledge that would help me make some other decisions in a time and not have to slow down to stop and think and go research and try to educate myself um, to, to make some decisions. But I, I guess overall, no, I mean, um, not, not an insurmountable hurdle, but I do think that I could have accelerated some things. I guess coming back to your question earlier, Pete, like what are some other piece of advice is be a lifelong learner too. Like you right. always have to be just, just, sucking up as much information as you can, reading, exploring, listening to podcasts, expose yourself to as much as you can. And you almost have to be obsessed with your, your trade to, to become an expert at it. And um, that, that is, that's, that's, that's mandatory. Yeah. I don't, I don't, um, I think about this a lot. I interview uh, people frequently now and talking about how success happened and there's no story that I in, have encountered yet that didn't come with an incredible work ethic and dedication to whatever it is that individual's doing. And it, it's it's rarely about education or background or you know how, um, you know, how whether you were able to start with a head you know you had a head start from the beginning. I mean I, I don't I'm sure that I know those stories exist, but those aren't the ones that I encounter. It, it is always a story of. You, it was having a goal and and a steadfast commitment to achieving it and really believing in it. Um, and and in that case, you know, education and history and background matters significantly less than what you're willing to do going forward. And it's a message I, I asked without knowing what your answer would be, but I'm not surprised by your answer because I'm yet to hear anything really to the contrary from people who find a way. I mean, you started two businesses, you're succeeding. Um, uh, in in a in an area where you're charting your own course, right? No one can no one can do that for you. You have that has to come from within. Yeah, I mean, I I don't want to take all the credit because my wife's at home working just as hard. Um, and like I think that's another important thing. If you do have a family, is to set realistic expectations on the front end of jumping off that cliff and taking those risks, um, because you know there's there's a lot of stress felt. At, at the home front as well. You know, there's a lot of sacrifice made to make sure things work here. There's a lot of weight borne by the shoulders of the entrepreneur that starts the business. And there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that's taken on, you know, by my wife and kids at home. So, um, you know, it, it, there's a conversation that should be had if you've got a family as well. You're, you're absolutely right. And um, I'm experiencing that for the second time now. So I started my staffing company 18 years ago. And um, two of my four kids weren't even born yet. And I you know, remember talking to my wife. She was pregnant with number three when I decided to quit my job to start Four Corner Resources. And I said, look, I'm going to do this. And, you know, she's like, just don't be stressed when the baby comes. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm a stress case 24-7. That, that's, that's not an option. Um, but to your point, she was very supportive. But that was a conscious decision that I knew I was going to have to sacrifice family time. And I did for, for years. And then that normalized as, as the business you know, survived and, and started to thrive. I was able to spend more time, but now I'm back in it with, um, with Zengig. And 
it weighs on me in a, in a different way because, you know, I still have two at home still, and I have to talk to my family on a regular basis that, Hey, I'm going to consciously remove myself from, um, from the time that I would otherwise be spending. And that's, that, that comes with a different kind of cost. You know, I mean, that, yeah. that's not easy to do. I, it, it's, it's harder for me to do now. Um, how conscious are you of, of, of that? And, and I mean, your kids probably aren't, how, how old your oldest? I mean, can you even have those conversations yet? My oldest is 11 and I do have those conversations. I mean, he's pretty, uh, you know, with it. Like, I think he understands and, you know, he actually repeats it back to me saying, Hey, I understand, you know, like why you're doing this and, and all that. So, um, but my youngest is six, so he doesn't get it yet. No, <laughs> no. But one day, right? I mean, you know, that they, they will. And I and and I think, you know, like me, you you probably you know realize that hey, there's there's lessons learned on both sides. And I know you're a very attentive parent. Um, and so you find that balance. But for anyone who uh, wants to be an entrepreneur, I I I think there's a um an expectation that is almost the polar opposite of reality that if I do this, I I if I don't you know, work as an employee, I will have more free time. And my experience is the exact opposite. I, I, you know, I was never more free than I was as an employee where I could take vacations and let someone else worry about it. And I had a backup to answer my call if I wasn't available. Has that been your experience too? Uh, yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. So it's not all rosy out there, but looking forward, Steve, what, um, let me ask you and, and just about the job market real quick. You're, you're knee deep. Like I am, we see, Lots of layoffs that have taken place over the past couple of weeks, very visible, um, lots of press. Still have 10 million job openings in the U.S. right now. It, it, but what do you, you know, there's signs, right? There's signs that things may um, may, may turn south a little bit. Um, we're seeing it a little bit. Some of my peers that I talk to in staffing are seeing it. What, what do you think, um, if you look ahead to 2023, what do, you, what do you see as the job market looking like? Well, I think uh, employees or the talent out in the market is they're, they're empowering or they're, they're exercising their empowerment right now. Um, and so there's all these openings and all these people that aren't working right now. They're not taking those opportunities. So I think they fully appreciate the value that they bring. Um, <clears throat> I've been in healthcare technology for a long time, and we're very fortunate in that it's relatively recession proof. Um, so you know, that area and domain, I don't think is going to be all that impacted, um, but some other industries may be impacted more retail hospitality potentially. Um, <clears throat> but I do, I do think that with greater access uh, and information and data, the talent is going to continue to be more and more empowered and employers going to have to bend and be a little bit more flexible on wages, on work scenarios, you know, remote, the list goes on and on. Well, I love that you're doing your part to help. You're helping the talent. You're helping employers as well. But you're, you're really helping to improve a, a marketplace that is in need of a facelift. So um, congratulations on where you are so far. Hopefully, you'll agree to come back maybe in a year. Tell us where you are with Abra um, after a year, and we can celebrate your success. How's that sound? Oh, I'd love that. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Pete. Always a pleasure, bud. Awesome. So we'll look, we'll put out your contact info on how to find Abra, how to find Shift Six in, in our show notes. And Steve Lomsky, thanks so much for joining today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Cheers, bud.